Please welcome Chief Security Officer, Akamai Technologies, Andy Ellis. Good morning, folks, and welcome back to another lovely day here in San Francisco. First off, I'd like to thank the RSA organizers for providing closed captioning for the keynotes. As someone who suddenly became hard of hearing last year, I personally really appreciate the inclusivity being shown, and I hope this makes it more accessible for more people. Every year, a group of security vendors gets up here on stage and regales you with stories of the new and novel threats that we all face, and tells you about the new buzzwords and technologies that are going to solve these new problems. I thought I'd take a different tack, and instead look at how we got here today. For those of you who aren't as familiar with Akamai, we're basically the shopping mall of the internet. What do you buy from a shopping mall? It's a trick question. Shoppers don't buy anything from a shopping mall. Stores do. They buy access to the infrastructure necessary to bring their experience closer to the edge where their users are. As the chief security officer, that basically makes me the internet's mall cop. <clears throat> 2020 is an opportune time for us to use our hindsight. And conveniently for me, I've also been at Akamai for 20 years and gotten to watch the evolution of the internet from what I think are the best seats in the house. And it strikes me that the problems that we face don't actually change that much from decade to decade as we rebrand the same challenges, adopting new technologies that expose us to similar hazards that we've already solved. In our first decade, Akamai was best known as a content delivery network, some of our old slides there, that is, an edge company that made websites perform better by caching and delivering pages closer to where the users are. We had some performance products and security features, and it was those features that our customers would sometimes rely on to protect themselves in the early days of the web. Why? because security embedded into a business system has a better chance of success than security tacked on separately. Security comes in many flavors, and I personally like the information security triad as a reasonable model to use to sort them. One of the early security controls that I helped work on at Akamai was object integrity. Many image formats used on the web have a peculiar feature if you begin reading part of one file and then start reading the end of another file, your browser will render that as one hybrid image. That's a challenge for a content delivery network, especially if those images were from two different customers, even as rare as file pointer errors are. When you're delivering millions of objects every second, a one in a billion error is going to happen dozens of times a day. So we added a system to embed watermarks inside each file so that we could continuously check that we were still reading the same file that we'd started. A few years later, with the dawn of the encrypted web, a similar challenge arose. How did we really know that the origin website we were talking to was the one that we intended to? Again, we needed to design a working control system to ensure that we could validate the origin site in the same way that we had validated the object we were reading before connecting an end user to it. We had to design and build a site integrity system to detect when network errors might create this problem, leading to content going to the worst or wrong places. And today, we've seen the rise of another integrity challenge as more and more websites are assembled dynamically in the browser from origins that are controlled by a number of different entities. This HTML supply chain for our banking, our news, and our entertainment sites exposes us because it includes JavaScript sourced from third-party libraries and advertising networks. How do we all make sure that our browsers aren't running code injected by an adversary? Sitting in the middle of the user and app ecosystem as I do, lets me understand and see how apps work, how users engage with them, combining that with the threat intelligence from attacks we've seen. 
And it lets us identify this new threat vector, form jacking, of the sort that the Magecart group exploits on a regular basis. Today, the average site is composed of 35% third-party content. Much of that content is scripts, of which the most common form is JavaScript. The Magecart group has been creating a new reality by exploiting a lack of security controls in the browser, either corrupting the supply chain for the company publishing the site, or corrupting the ecosystem provider that publishes content that then gets included into the site. The result is experienced by businesses who've seen massive GDPR fines, not for directly leaking user identity, but for failing to ensure page integrity where the content ended up being exposed. Web page integrity is the next challenge to solve in the integrity domain. While we were building these integrated integrity features on the back end, if you will, hazards on the front end bring different challenges. Availability is often overlooked as part of the information security domain, but nothing has presented a greater threat to it than DDoS and flash crowds. The first DDoS attacks we ever saw were primarily self-inflicted. A viral marketing campaign for Victoria's Secret or BET a Super Bowl ad that the marketing team and IT team hadn't really planned for its success might lead to a flash crowd that would take down a website. Maybe a virus with an attack payload, like Code Red when it targeted the White House, would lead to a conversation about using offload capabilities as a security measure. But there wasn't really a full-fledged market for DDoS attacks and defense in the early 2000s but flash crowd management made site availability a real challenge for all of us to address. In those early days, I recall an antivirus vendor whose antivirus updates created a problem because downloads took over an hour for each user. And since updates would download at the same time, local time, every day, as computers in the next time zone would hit that time, they would begin downloading, and their servers would be crushed all day long. Basically, they had implemented their own predictable DDoS attack on themselves, unfortunately. But the traffic only took an hour because they couldn't handle that attack. When they move that delivery out to the edge, that flash crowd just becomes hourly spikes. But complex marketing campaigns, like when Logitech wanted to give away keyboards to everybody in America, or at least to some subset of them, but wanted to ensure they were well distributed, would drive edge computing needs as lotteries would need to run closer to the edge, protecting infrastructure from massive traffic spikes. Site availability requirements would drive in computational features that users needed from those lotteries to image resizing and management to video archiving and playback and a whole host of other capabilities at the edge. But that absence of a primary market for DDoS defense, that would change with Operation Payback and the rise of Anonymous. DDoS had spent several years mostly as internecine warfare amongst businesses who operated in legal gray areas like offshore gambling and organizations who might attack their rivals or extortionists who would try to shut down smaller enterprises. The first generations of DDoS attacks really focused on front-end resources, like your ISP's network capacity, sometimes consuming them with a lot of traffic, sometimes targeting carefully chosen resource, like Slow Loris attempting to use the fewest possible packets to keep open all available web server connections. But the rise of Anonymous coincided with the democratization of attack tools. Low Orbit Ion Cannon, or LOIC, was the most popular for straight DDoS attacks, but we started to see a shift. More and more adversaries were targeting the web applications themselves, either to gain access to a server, potentially to conduct a defacement, or to attack a more valuable resource. As we learned how to defend against each of these, we realized that we had shifted from site availability to application availability. And that required not just capacity at the edge, but bringing compute to bear on that problem. 
is we implemented not only web application firewalls and application performance management, but context-aware rate limiting to bear on this challenge. When we first entered that WAF market, what we had heard from everyone, and frankly believed ourselves, was that rules had to be tailored by hand for every application, because web application firewalls were finicky devices, and that integrations were therefore long and expensive and time-consuming. To all of those early customers for WAFs, ours or someone else's, I'd like to apologize on behalf of the industry. We were wrong. You see, many of the early WAFs had started with carefully tailored rule sets, but over time, as they had uh, grew through community involvement, many of the rule sets weren't tested in a diversity of environments. So this rule, intended to catch little bobby tables, worked lovely, unless, of course, your user was searching for that drop leaf table that you were selling. WAFs were too literal without optimized rule sets. Optimizing that rule set, but more importantly, shifting to a model where multiple indicators could be looked for independently would take the WAF market forward, taking it from being a hindrance to the industry with WAFs sometimes stuck on a shelf to being a transparent and effective security control that everyone is expected to use. But adversaries have continued to adapt and evolve. And while we still see DDoS attacks, just at larger sizes, we're now seeing attacks in excess of one terabit per second. The way in which one of the most modern attacks is conducted, credential stuffing, mirrors those early original DDoS attacks. An adversary has a collection of usernames and passwords, and they would like to test on your site which ones will work. Once they've succeeded at account takeover, they can then complete the next stage of their attack, which frankly might just be to sell that higher quality data. Because like 10 years ago, tools were being shared, now the work is too. The gig economy has come to the DDoS and fraud spaces, with professional bot herders who will assemble and operate a bot network and rent it to someone who will only conduct their attack for a few hours or maybe a day or two. And those attacks might just be in service of selling more information that breach personal data or information about accounts that work in a given space or at a given site, with the additional benefit of separating information across attackers, making defense correlation much harder. We've even seen adversaries starting to use defender information sharing platforms for reconnaissance. Each attack, they'll send unique attack signatures to a site and wait to see which ones pop up on those information sharing platforms, letting them know which sites are being monitored. This new world of account availability will continue to evolve and present major challenges as we all seek to better engage in bot management. Of course, we can't have discussed two legs of the InfoSec triad without talking about the third, confidentiality. In the early days of the web, no one really used TLS, or really we should call it SSL because that was its name then. But since it's changed its name, we'll go with TLS. We realized that to support the confidentiality needs at the edge, we need to design and build for object and site confidentiality, a TLS CDN, if you will. This entailed building a distributed lights out key management system and growing trust in the idea of conducting sensitive transactions across the internet, which you might all recall we had all believed had already reached its pinnacle of achievement in the distribution of kitten pictures. For many of the customers of ours who had moved to TLS in that first decade, we had transformed from a merely an edge delivery company into a performance or edge compute company with both offload and security products, and that's when Aurora hit. I got up here two years ago to tell you about Aurora. RSA helpfully has that video online, but a short takeaway is that passwords suck and lateral movement also sucks. With other security products starting to gain traction for us, a breach of this type couldn't be allowed to repeat itself. 
So as we had in redesigning our content delivery network a decade before, we began transforming our enterprise network. That zero trust transformation has taken Akamai most of a decade, much because we were breaking new ground alongside other companies like Google with its Beyond Corp initiative. The challenge that we all faced was enterprise confidentiality, and it was this belief that architectures were rooted in a single secure enterprise land. It probably never really was all that secure, but most importantly, originally, it was disconnected. And as our networks began to be more and more interconnected, the hazards to enterprise confidentiality outpaced our architectures. I'll be honest, our first attempt at redesign was ineffective. I tried to lead us down the then best practice of network micro-segmentation, but in a modern enterprise, that presents an administrative and logistical nightmare for implementation. The obvious place to start is by isolating your servers from lateral movement. But so many servers today are parts of an integrated ecosystem, from backup servers to configuration management to vulnerability scanning. Time is short. If you'd like the whole list, go walk the show floor. The real problem wasn't in which computers could talk to which computers, but really in which applications could talk to which applications. And rather than trying to isolate piece by piece, could we instead isolate the most unpredictable part of the enterprise, the users? Now, this isn't a blame the users tirade. Users are unpredictable because they provide business values in ways we can't predict in advance and they'll do things we couldn't anticipate. And at the same time, we provide them with tools that are fundamentally dangerous to them. The two biggest hazards in the enterprise are the web browser and the email client, both of which are basically designed to let you, or the adversary, hide important safety information from a user. And it doesn't help that we demand our users click on sketchy-looking links to get paid or to engage in HR training right before we then tell them to stop clicking on sketchy looking links. So we wondered if we could ensure enterprise confidentiality by isolating our users, not from the internet, but from the enterprise itself. We redesigned our enterprise connectivity to put our entire edge network between our users and our corporate systems giving users a predictable and consistent interface, security controls enforced at the edge, cryptographic protocol selection, authentication styles, as well as application security controls for our internal applications. Along the way on that redesign, we, which paralleled some of those early zero trust initiatives, we relearned an important truth about good design, that this arrow trading off performance against security is wrong. In a well-designed system, you can end up with both. Which brings us to the next challenge in confidentiality, identity confidentiality. As regulations like GDPR and CCPA indicate, protecting identities, not merely from breaches, but also from internal and corporate misuse, is an area that companies with far-flung user bases need to address. James Pover presented at Black Hat this past summer about how GDPR compliance activities can create a new risk by sending demand letters on behalf of his girl, fiance with her knowledge, but without any form of explicit transmittable consent to 150 companies, he was able to extract her personal information from dozens of them. Complying with these regulations while keeping this data safe is going to be a new hazard in confidentiality for businesses to address. And while I haven't even touched on many of the other environmental challenges that will take existing hazards and give us new challenges, like IoT with its challenge of unpatchable embedded systems, or 5G, which might someday give us ubiquitous internet to connect all of those IoT systems with, let's all recognize that addressing those challenges will, at least, keep folks in our industry gainfully employed for the foreseeable future. 
So I'd like to thank you all for coming out this morning, and may you all have safe travels back to your homes or onwards to your next destination. Thank you.